ready. Okay, hello everybody. Welcome to Don't Miss This. I, <laughs> my, my voice is so funny. I'm Emily Freeman. <laughs> and I'm David Butler. And this week we're doing uh, Matthew 6 and 7, which is part 2 of the Sermon on the Mount. So chapter 5 we did last week, and then 6 and 7, he's still there on the mountaintop. He's still with that same group of disciples who ascended up to the mountain for him to try and lift them and teach them just this higher and nobler and holier way of And we're just dying to know about your list of Beatitudes, your constitution for happiness. Oh. Did you love writing that? And how should people share them? Because we really want to I, I really want to steal one of yours. So That's what yeah. <laughs> that I want to so do. Fun. Okay, this one is great. Um, one of the most famous parts that we want to start with in... Uh, famous parts, can you say that? Yes. In the Sermon on the Mount is the Lord's Prayer. Um, and we're just going to read it first. Um, he starts the Lord's Prayer in verse 9 and says, After this manner you should pray. So that's neat that the Lord is the personal tutor to the disciples in, in how to pray and how to have a prayer life. I just love that he is the one who's going to show them how to have relationship with the Father. Um, and he says this, um, after this manner pray ye, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And that might be one that you actually recited along with us. It's one that so many people know and they memorize and and, and they just love the words of it. It's, a, it's beautiful. It's beautiful poetry. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful words. But as we were looking at it, we kind of thought two things. One, what if he was teaching a pattern of prayer? And have you ever looked at the words a little bit more closely and picked words in that prayer that, you know, really stood out to you? So here's some of just our favorites mm -hmm. from the Lord's Prayer. And, and you'll find some that, that you just love too. But uh, we love that it starts off, the first words of that prayer are our Father. That That's how Jesus teaches us to pray, to address. Of all the titles of God, um, that's the one he favors the most, is for us to call him um, Father. And, and it positions us in, in the right place when, when we start a prayer to realize and understand, I'm not approaching a boss, I'm not approaching even though he is a king, even though he's sovereign mm -hmm. in the universe, I, I'm approaching him as a, as a father, not a criminal talking to a judge, but a child speaking to a father. And that trusting and intimate relationship that, that's there. I remember my friend telling me when he came home from the hospital after his first baby was born that, you know, they're there and his wife's in the wheelchair up at the the Rip little desk. place yeah. and you fill out the form and he writes the name of his of his son right there on the paper name and writes his name and then and then as the one filling out the paper it says relationship to patient and he wrote um father and he says the first time i ever wrote that it's the first time i ever felt that i had that title and uh he said something just surged in me and um you've had that same mm -hmm. experience i've had that one where just a chamber of your heart that you didn't even know was there opens up and and you be, and you feel for you know your children and so that's neat to mm -hmm. that's how Jesus like this is the posture of prayer that I'm approaching you God as my father someone I can trust someone who is good someone who loves me who's going to protect me yeah. who's going to watch over me yeah and there's a, and there's some sometimes people are a little bit afraid and they say but then will people like kind of trample over him because of that familiarity and it's like well not really because then I can't if I know he's father I don't spend the rest of my life in sin because it would break his heart mm. you know a yeah. boss would fire me if I break the rules you know but a father it breaks his heart you know if 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 I if I do mm -hmm. you know and so it's just a really powerful posture there that's neat um, one other one I, I wanted to bring up is is he says in that second line second line or mine <laughs> <laughs> Um, <laughs> thy kingdom come. And that could be interpreted so many ways, right? Mm -hmm. It could be the second coming that we're praying for to come uh, for the end of disasters and war and, and everything in the world. And what a fantastic thing to pray for. And, and I often do. Like, mm -hmm. Just come quickly, Lord. Um, but that's also a prayer that we can offer right now. Come with your power and your mercy and your grace and your goodness. 
come spilling into my life. It's that great hymn that we have. Uh, come, oh, thou king of kings. Like, come right now and intervene in, in my story in this moment at, at this time, even as I anticipate you coming in the glory in the clouds later. Come in your glory today when I need you. Yeah. Uh, we love that next part down, that, um, just right down from there too, where it says in verse 11, give us this day our daily bread. And if you look um, at a comparable um, chapter for this, it would be Luke 11. And this prayer in Luke 11, verse 3 says, um, day by day. Give us this bread day by mm. day. And I just love how it helps us understand that word daily just a little bit more, that he is going to come day by day. He knows where you are. He knows what's happening right now, today, in your story. And he's concerned with the daily. He's concerned mm -hmm. with just the every day. What's going on with you today? How can I help? If you were just to think of that, what, what do I need today? Um, what would it be yeah. for you? And, and I also really love about that, that it, and, and it's frustrating that it's daily bread, you know, because it really teaches a trusting relationship. Mm -hmm. there, I, I mean, yeah. I want to pray for weekly bread or yearly <laughs> yes. or decadely bread, you know, like, Lord, set me up for the next 10 years. You know, I want to be all, I know, I want to know what's going to happen. I want to know, yes. but he's just like, no, I actually want you to come every day. Yep. I want you to trust every day. I want you to rely on me. You know, yeah. Grace had a seminary teacher once time. who taught this principle so well. Um, she brought Grace up to the front of the classroom and she asked Grace how many times a day she brushes her teeth and Grace said two. And so she, she got out, um, <laughs> don't tell their, don't tell her dentist, everyone. She got out the um, tube of toothpaste and she pulled out a toothbrush and she put enough toothpaste on the toothbrush for a week. <laughs> and then she made Grace put it in her mouth and try and brush with all that toothpaste at once. And the whole class was watching. And Grace was like, it was everywhere. It was all over my face. It was all down my shirt. If you know Grace, you know it was all down my shirt. And <laughs> she's fine. And um, yeah, and she's just trying to brush away. And uh, their seminary teacher taught him, now do you see the importance of day Calling by day? On a baby. Right? Just day by day in little doses whenever you need him. Yeah, and if anyone's looking for a fun object lesson, then That'd there's be one, awesome. right? For yeah. if you have younger so kids awesome. or Grace's age, yeah. Any, anything <laughs> will do. Um, then this next line, isn't this neat? Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Um, just that word forgive is so liberating and has so much power to it. And, mm -hmm. and, and again, this connection to, to being a father. I remember I um, came home or went upstairs to my room one night and there was a little note on my pillow um, from my oldest son and I opened it up and, and it was these ripped out pages from a notebook. <laughs> I should have brought it stapled along the side with this green marker just in the cutest you know seven eight year old handwriting with backwards letters dear dad you know is on the front and and i opened it up and it's a letter book and it said what happened was this i took your laser pointer to school which i didn't even know i had everybody <laughs> i didn't even know i owned a laser pointer and i and i lost it it must have fallen out when I pulled my lunchbox out of my backpack. I searched all the hallways and all of the places and couldn't find it. Tomorrow, I will ask the office if it's there. If it's not, I will do extra jobs and earn a new laser pointer for you. And then it, and, and then it said, love, Jack. And then at the end, it said, P.S., um, can you ever forgive me? And that was the first time in my life when I realized why God is so forgiving. Um, because it's a little, it's it's his little boy, it's his little girl approaching him as a father and just saying, and I was like, well, of course, what a silly question. <laughs> of course I forgive you. Um, and I just, every time I read that line, that's the story I think of. Oh, Father, forgive us our debts. And he says, why wouldn't I? I'm your, I'm your dad. So good. I love that one. And then we love in 13, and lead us not into, into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And one of our favorite things to do is to look up uh, the translation for the words, if they would have been in Hebrew, if they would have been in Greek. And in Hebrew, the word for deliver, there are actually two words, and their definitions both are so powerful. And maybe you want to write these somewhere where you can remember every time you see the word deliver. Um, the first word is yasha. It means to preserve, rescue, defend, 
succor, or help. And the other word is magan, and it means to shield and to hand safely over. And I just love the thought of that. Again, where are you at right now? And what do you need him to do for you right now? Do you need him to shield you? Do you need him to protect you? Do you need to be rescued right now? Do do you need him to run to you in the place where you are? Um, Do you just need him to hand you safely over to, to where you're going next? They're just such beautiful definitions of that word delivered. That is what he is going to do for us. He is the deliverer. Right, right. That's his title and that's his job. Yeah. And and we love that you can take um, one word from each of the lines in the Lord's Prayer. And what if you prayed um, a one word prayer is what you'll see on, on the study sheet and here just and a little blank and you'll probably need more room mm-hmm. than just the blank that's there. But we picked just a couple of words. Like, what if you prayed this one word prayer? What if you prayed, come? That was your word. And, and why, what if you spent some time writing? Why what would you, that look like? Yeah, why, why do you need, need him to come into your life and story? Or today, what is it that you need today from him? Or forgive. Do you need forgiveness? Um, do you need to forgive? And then um, deliver, like you were just saying. Yeah. Like, what do you? Why? Where do you need a shield? Where do you need to be handed yeah. safely over? So we thought that would be a really powerful. Probably not together. I don't know if you have older mm-hmm. kids. It might be everyone could take a couple of minutes by themselves and just, just write think, in a journal. Where, yeah. And, what What part do yeah. I need answered? Yeah. Right what's now? my one word prayer today? Mm-hmm. You know, you can say more than one word. Just you know, when you pray. But you know what? Yeah, if, they're just such powerful words. They're just please, and we love. We just love the message in the power of the Lord's prayer. Yeah, so awesome as a, mm-hmm. as a pattern. Um, it ends in verse 13, and Jesus teaches us two things. One is how and why he can do this, which is, um, he says at the end of 13, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. That God has, um, he is both willing and able. He has both the capability and compassion. You love when um, it says power, right? He has all power. To do it. He's in charge of the whole kingdom. There's there's nothing that he can't do. Right. That that's our father. That's who he is. Right, right. So he's he's almighty God yeah. and loving father at at the same time. And so he can. He can answer any of those one word prayers yeah. that are there. What we love about Matthew 6 is there are so many lessons on prayer. There, there are more lessons than we even know what to do with here, and you'll see that as we go through. But um, another of our favorites is just right down from there in verse 28 when he says, And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And... Um, I love that thought. He gets into verse 30, Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? And and so then he tells you to take no thought for what is going to happen tomorrow. Just let him take care of you today. And um, I have always loved that scripture. I have fallen in love with that scripture over and over at different times in our life. I remember falling in love with it when Josh was diagnosed with diabetes when he was three and just thinking to myself, if, if he remembered the lilies, he's going to remember me, right? And he's going to remember mm-hmm. Josh. And um, again, when Greg was out of a job, um, for all of those months, I would just keep coming back to this scripture. And it's a scripture I have held on to in the hardest times of our life. I have held on to it. Well, we had an interesting experience several months ago. Um, I love scripture so much. If you know me well, you just know I love the scriptures. I always have. There is just something in me that is drawn to them. And I am particularly fond of the New Testament and the Old Testament. And people have said to me my whole life, you need to go to Jerusalem. You need to get to Israel. And I've always wanted to. I've always wanted to do that. And Greg and I would set money aside and we would think we were going to do that. And then the dryer would break or someone would need their (laughs) car fixed or um, someone needed a surgery. Or every time something went wrong, we were pulling out of the Israel fund. And I kind of had gotten to the point where I was like, that probably actually is never going to happen for us. And it's okay because I have a super good imagination and I love the scripture. So I just was going to imagine Israel for the rest of my life. And then um, about a year ago, we got this phone call and they were in need. This company was in need of two people to come help lead the tour buses on this trip to Israel. And our names had been recommended, Greg and I's and 
our job was just to go. They would pay for our whole way there. We got to have the whole trip, and I was in charge of a bus of 40 people, and Greg was in charge of a bus of 40 people. And so it was free, but a lot of work, work. <laughs> at the same time. And we jumped on it, and we were so busy getting trained and so busy doing everything we needed to do that I, I just didn't even think about it. I just got ready, and um, we, we had never been to Israel, but our job was to get all 80 people through France and then over into Jordan and then through the border crossing at Jordan. And once we got into Israel, the man who was really good at leading the tour would meet us there. And we weren't supposed to lose anyone or let anyone die <laughs> on our watch. And I was consumed with all of that. And then we got into Israel and finally I could breathe. And I sat on the bus and the, our first stop was gonna be right when we got there, we just went straight to the hills overlooking Galilee. And we climbed up and, and we got to this beautiful place where we sat down and our teacher started teaching us um, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And he turned to 6 and um, he said, how many of you would like to see a lily of the field? And immediately, all of a sudden, that was the first moment that I realized somehow we had gotten to Israel. I don't know how it happened, but there I was in Israel. And the first thing that was going to happen is I was going to see this lily of the field that I have read about over and over and over again in my life. And um, he pointed out to us this, if you've never seen one before, they're these fragile red flowers. They look like poppies, actually. That's a Jerusalem lily. And there was one just right there where he was teaching and all the way down that field. And then everywhere we went in Jerusalem and in Israel for that whole next two weeks, everywhere, the pool of Bethesda, um, when we went to the field where David and Goliath happened, when we went into the main part of Jerusalem, everywhere we went, there was a lily there everywhere, almost as if God was saying, I know who you are, and I know what's happening in your life, and every so often, I'm going to send you a lily. And sometimes it's going to be a trip to Israel, right? And sometimes it's going to be when your husband doesn't have a job. And sometimes it's going to be when your three-year-old gets diagnosed with diabetes. Um, but I'm going to be there, right? I'm going to be in that moment. And we thought it would be so neat for you to just think of what are the lily moments in your life? Where are the places where you have seen the Lord entering into your story and into your prayers and into your situations and you just know he knows who you are. He considers you. Mm. Um, he watches over you and he's going to take care of us. He's going to clothe us. He's going to watch over us. That's his promise. And it's just such a beautiful promise. Yeah. And sometimes that maybe in that box, you'll write answers to prayers and mm -hmm. sometimes, and maybe you'll write just assurances that he is considering you because maybe that prayer is forthcoming. Maybe yeah. that answer is in the wings. It's yeah. in the works. It might be something you've been waiting for. Yeah. And, and, and maybe so, that would never happen. Right. And sometimes he just gives a little moment of like, Hey, just hold on, that answer is still coming. Yeah. It's still on the way. Now we have to take a trip to Israel. That's the second oh, week in a row we I talked know. about it. Okay, I we're know. starting a tour. Okay. Who wants to come? <laughs> <laughs> Who wants to come? The, the don't miss this. The don't miss this. Tour to tour Israel. Tour to Israel. It's yes. going to be great. <laughs> well, we can't help it. We're just going to keep going on this theme of prayer. Um, if you flip over to Matthew 7, there is this promise in Matthew 7 that you're familiar with, 7-7. Um, where, and there's blanks on, on the, on the page. We've said this in our newsletter before that sometimes when there's blanks like this, it's great if you have different age kids mm -hmm. to link up older kids and younger kids together and have them work in teams to fill out. That's why we put some of those on the study guide for that reason. But just this promise that's here, it's neat to see this promise in verse seven, um, what you, we do and then what God, um, does. We ask and he gives, we seek and he shows um, we knock and and then it's given and just that promise that's all over. I think it's the most repeated yes. promise in all of scripture um, is ask and you shall receive. And I remember um, one time, remember the talk President Hinckley gave where he was going to talk about the summum bonum of it all. And I remember thinking to myself, how does a prophet choose the summum the bonum of it all, of all scripture, of everything? I was waiting for this big, profound moment and... Um, then he read a scripture, ask, and it shall be given you. Yeah. Right? Ask and you shall receive. And that that is the greatest promise. Yeah. And at the heart of it is father-child relationship. Mm -hmm. That's what's so, yeah. so you good. know, potent about it. But he goes on and he illustrates and he says, you know, sometimes 
Um, verse 9, he says, What man of there is there of you, if his son asks him for bread, is going to give him a stone? And what dad out there, if, a, if his kid asks him for a fish, he's going to give him a snake, a serpent? You know, he's like, people don't do that. <laughs> like, nobody like, Dad, I'm so hungry. Well, have a rock, you know? Um, dad, can I have something to eat? Here's a, here's a poisonous snake. You know, dads don't do that. And he says, if then you being evil or not as good as me is what that word evil means there, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your father, which is in heaven, give good gifts to them that ask? And so um, this fill in the blank here is that the father gives good gifts, you know, to those who ask. And what's interesting about that is he is a good, good father. Uh, which means every answer to prayer, even if it's a wait, is a good gift. Mm -hmm. It's the right gift. And sometimes you might get an answer that you think looks like a rock or looks like a serpent, but it's not because our Father doesn't give rocks and He doesn't give serpents. He gives bread and He gives fish. He gives the, the good gifts that we need. And it might take time to realize, oh, that wasn't a rock after all. I remember a, um, a friend who um, had moved here from the East Coast, and he uh, um, had an accident at home on a roof. He was on a roof, and he was a roofer. I think I said roof seven <laughs> times in that sense. Everybody, if you didn't know, the man was on a roof when this story gets told. That's what's going to happen. Anyways, he falls off the top of his house, the, uh, the roof, and he broke his back. And um, the best specialist for it was out here. And so he came out here to meet with these specialists. And while he was here, there were neighbors that he met who introduced him uh, to the Lord, introduced him to finding God in his life. And he ended up making big changes in his life and developed a relationship with him. And um, he was baptized a member of the Church of Jesus Christ. And at his baptism, he actually said, I know why I'm here. And he said, um, God pushed me off the roof. Um, what seemed like um, a stone or a serpent in his life was actually bread. It was actually fish. Yeah. It was a good Isn't gift. Isn't that a great story? I love that story yeah, so much. Yeah, the line is the best. Yeah, one. that, that he, he pushed, pushed me. me. Yeah, this is so good. And um, one of the other things we want you to notice there, just something you may want to study throughout the week. And um, in the next couple of weeks, there are so many things we have to tell you. Some of what we'll be doing is giving you invitations to study on your own because we just cannot fit it into a half hour. You'd have to listen to us for three hours. And, and then you'd be sad. Right. So um, look how interesting it is that the two things he promises to give is bread and fish, right? Loaves and fishes. And there are a lot of times in scripture where we see loaves and fishes taught together. This is one place where it is taught together. Um, we'll be looking at some of the other ones as we come up to them. But if that's something you want to look at, it might be interesting to see what, what was the prayer in those stories and what was the blessing that comes. The chapters where you will find those are John 6, Mark 8, and John 21. So if you, if you kind of want to research into that loaves and fishes, and those are links that you might want to stick in your scriptures right here, just so you'll remember next time you're here. Oh yeah, he's talking about bread and fish and there's a loaves and fishes promise and, and that is something he teaches over and over again. The other thing that we thought might be really neat for your families to be able to do together if you haven't before is go to the Bible dictionary and study prayer. There are so many lessons in the Bible dictionary on prayer we're not going to mention all of them but you will love reading through them and just finding there's so many things that we learn about prayer. One of our very favorite quotes is in the seventh paragraph right in the middle it says this the object of prayer is not to change the will of God, but to secure for ourselves and for others blessings that God is already willing to grant, but that are made conditional on our asking for mm. them. And just remembering the importance of taking the time to ask, yes. right? Enter into the conversation. He's just waiting right. um, to, to help us and to, to listen and to lead and do all of those things. And we just got to enter in. We, we need to ask. Yeah, and some may, some may wonder, why do I have to ask if God already knows all things? He knows what I want. He knows what He wants to give. And, and that God wants us into relationship with Him. Mm. There's something about being vulnerable, not knowing what the answer will be despite what we want. That, that it draws us closer mm -hmm. to each other. And He doesn't want to be a butler or a servant. He wants to be a father. And He wants to 
be with us in those moments. And that's a, that is a powerful promise. He says, there are things that have happened in this universe because people asked. Mm -hmm. And there are things that have not because people have not. It almost seems like so simple, but it's so powerful to just ask the just ask and, and to be thinking what do i need to be asking for look at your life what are the things that you should be asking for and sometimes it's okay to just ask the spirit to help you with that what what should we be praying for yeah. right now what yeah. should we be asking for in our home inspiration will come yeah. through the spirit that's awesome okay we want to talk about one last thing today and that is at the very end of matthew 7 where the Lord ends the, the Sermon on the Mount with this great, the wise man and the foolish man who build their house upon the rock. Uh, I feel a song coming on, <laughs> you know. Um, so this is such a, a great section of scripture, but the, a couple things that we love about this spot is there are two houses in this story, and it says when the rains and the winds come, that they come on both of those houses. The one built on the rock and the one built on the sand. It, it is just... He says that earlier in the Sermon on the Mount, I, I reign on the good and on the evil. Mm -hmm. I, I, I shine the sun on the good and the evil. Um, and sometimes we think, if I just build my house on the rock, it's going to be sunny for the rest of my life. Right. And it's so important to go back in there and realize, no, it's going to rain on both. Yeah. And what's the difference between those two is it's so important. I mean, the, what the rock actually means. And the rock is a symbol of, of Jesus, uh, of the Savior. Build your life build your home around him if if my kids just leave my house knowing how to look to him mm -hmm. how to rely and trust him then they're going to be okay whatever happens there will be storms there will be winds but learn to just turn to him look to him and, and trust him and we have a box here that where you can talk about and write about what are the ways that how does that look and just, I would just make sure that the emphasis is on him rather than on commandments or anything like mm -hmm. that. But how do we like connect actually with, you know, with him? We had the opportunity this week to hear from Elder Rasban at a seminary and institute meeting that we attended. And his whole talk is so powerful. It's something you actually might want to go and watch. If you just search seminary and institute and Rasban, it will come up. It's on LDS.org. And there are so many parts of that talk that were so good. But one of our favorite parts as we think about The Rock is this quote. He said, Try just saying the name Jesus Christ in a perilous setting with one who has lost hope. Just calling upon him by name with reverence can make a difference in a difficult moment. And I just love the thought of that. The thought of just the power of the name of Jesus Christ and the yeah. hope it brings and the promise it brings. And someone just thinking like, I don't know how to connect my life with him. I don't know how to build on that rock. And Elder Rasband's promise, just say his name. Just the mention of his name can begin to, peace and hope will begin to flow into your, into your life and story. Yeah. It's just that easy. So good. So thanks for being with us. Hey. We love being here. We'll see you see next, next week. week.